for responding to this invitation from the Innovative Learning Concepts uh, to participate in a timely and what I think is a very necessary conversation about collaborating with remote development teams. My name is Jackie Poto, for those uh, who don't know me, and I'm the co-founder and executive director of ILC. I'm coming to you from uh, Boston, but ILC is based in Mirambale in the central plateau region of Haiti. Uh, we came into existence in 2017 after we realized there was a need for shifting conversations about technology and innovation away from the Republic of Port-au-Prince and bring it to uh, the countryside, in our case, in the central plateau. But that is just to start because our ultimate goal is really to uh, make sure our work touch many, many areas, many corners of Haiti. Uh, we were well aware of the challenges uh, to operating outside of port au and we made a decision to go to the central plateau because we believe that young people living in the countryside have the exact same access, they should have the exact same access to technology, just like folks co uh, living in, in, in the capital. So for the past two years, we've been uh, providing training in uh, English, coding, and entrepreneurship because we believe these things will be necessary skills for today and many, many years to come. For From the onset, we decided to focus more on quality and less on quantity because we want to continue to accompany our participants in our programs throughout the journey, providing them with all the necessary support they need so they can be successful. Uh, this webinar is about effective ways to collaborate with remote development teams. Uh, I, want, I need to say that we've been living in a different world for many years now, and the traditional way we used to think of work has been changed significantly. More and more people study, shop, and work online. However, the online work environment has its own culture, and this is what we will be discussing for the next 90 minutes or so. And to lead these very important discussions, we wish out to Ms. Becca Dejan, I want to thank Becca on behalf of the entire RLC team for taking time out of uh, her busy schedule to be with us. Becca will talk a little bit about herself, share with us an overview of her company, The B Print, and she'll share also some insights on telework, working from a distance, and how to take advantage of the new and unique opportunities offered by COVID-19 pandemic, ironically. Becca is a result-driven problem solver with a decade of experience executing successful projects and programs. She's also an expert in offshore, nearshore team models, including relationship management, training, team building, coaching, and culture integration. What is it that you don't do, Becca? Uh, <laughs> and I invite you to check Becca out on LinkedIn under Rebecca Deschamps. Without further delay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to present to you Miss Becca Dejan. Thank you so much, Jackie. I am thrilled to be with you all. And I'd love to start with my story, actually. Um, so Jackie gave you guys some background, but I actually started my business at the first Haiti Tech Summit that took place in 2017. Um, the way that came about is it was my second time visiting Haiti. I have family that lives in Petionville as well as Port-au-Prince. And after Hurricane Matthew, my spirit told me I needed to go home and figure out how to get in touch with my fellow Haitian people. Now, I've, I was born in the States in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and I had never traveled to Haiti before that. My parents are both um, born in Haiti, but now living here in the U.S. And because of their experiences as young children, they actually never traveled back to Haiti. But there was something that always kept me very curious about Haiti. And so when I had the opportunity to go, I called my parents. I said, Mommy, Daddy, I know you guys, you know, may have some concerns. You may have some fears, but I'm going to Haiti. I'm going by myself. My matant told me to come and I'm going to go and figure out how I can get involved. I traveled to Haiti for the first time in 2016 and spent three weeks there and discovered the amazing spirit of the Haitian people and I knew I was home. Um, from there, I decided I would come back for the Haiti Tech Summit in 2017. 
while I was there, I put a quick company together because I had some skill sets around software development, project management, and building websites. And so I said to myself, let me just go explore, see who I can meet, figure out how I can help. While I was at the Haiti Tech Summit, I had the pleasure of meeting, some of you guys may know him, um, Ted Barlow. He is the founder of New Code. Oh, I know Ted. And New Code was running at the University of Kiskeya, a boot camp teaching engineers software development. When I learned that they were doing some project work for different organizations here in the U.S., I automatically lit up and said, this might be an opportunity for us to collaborate and maybe I can help them find some paid opportunities and not just paid, but well-paid opportunities. And so it took us about a year after we developed our relationship, but we finally received our first yes from a company in Austin. They were willing to take a chance on working with some of our engineers. There were so many lessons learned. There were some things that we had to train the teams on because there's a lot of differences between you know, different countries and cultures and communication and that sort of thing. And so I came back to Haiti to do a training on Scrum. Um, Scrum is basically a, a, a program um, that helps development teams with processes and procedures so that they're able to manage project risk, manage project scope, and manage project budget. And so while I was um, there for the second time, I got the team trained and they are now certified scrum masters. And so Ted and I have basically been partnering to not only create jobs in Haiti, but also help the team members reach their own entrepreneurial journey. So our goal is that they don't work with us forever, that they actually create their own companies or their own products or their own mobile apps, and they can create their own economic prosperity for their families. And so I'm committed to that work. That's why I'm talking to you all today is to give you some tips and pointers that I've learned doing this work. I've now had two years of experience bringing Haitian teams and, 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 and collaborating with U.S. teams to build amazing products and to provide amazing services. Um, so before I dive in, any, any questions about the B-Print specifically, what we do, um, and kind of how we work? Uh, not specifically, but if you could probably just give us a, a quick overview of the company. Absolutely. Yep. So I'll pull up our site. Can you guys still see my screen? Sure. Okay, perfect. And so we help build and architect dreams. And so basically, if an entrepreneur has a mobile app idea, or maybe they want to start a new business, they'll find a partner like us. Fill out a form, which here's our form, and they'll let us know exactly what they're looking to do. Maybe they want to build a website. Maybe they want to design a new brand or logo. Maybe they need multiple services. We also offer training. And so for some people, maybe they want to learn how to do it themselves. Maybe they want to learn how to become programmers or designers. And so we'll provide that service to them as well. And then our typical U.S. clients, they're looking for talent. So they're looking for people like you and myself to help them build products and services for their business. Um, and so that, in a nutshell, is pretty much what we do. And so we focus on branding, so designing brands, building web applications, building mobile applications, and then also developing talent. And the talent is the most important piece, right? So people over process, people over, over profit, because without the people, businesses cannot thrive. Mm -hmm. And so this is our real initiative is really figuring out how do we develop talent in Haiti so that U.S. clients and entrepreneurs that are looking for talent have Haiti as an option, because I see Haiti as a tech hub for the future of, of innovation. The clients that we help are mainly entrepreneurs, small business, and nonprofit. And so there are times where nonprofit organizations may reach out to us because they need help with funding. And so maybe we'll put together a campaign for them. Uh, maybe we'll put together a landing page for them or a web application to help them drive the cause that they're looking for us to support. And here's an example of one of the clients that we've had for actually three years. This is one of our first clients. They're a nonprofit organization in Austin, 
and they focus on representing um, minorities and people of color through research, best practices, and community action. Um, mm -hmm. And so we built a web application for them, which you can see here. Um, and we can actually look at the full solution. So we built the application. We also did the design for the brand and we built some custom features to allow them to really have everything that they need for donations, volunteers, and events. And so this is an example of how we help clients. They come to us and say, the B print, we have this idea. And we take them through a series of exercises from discovery to coming up with different ideas, to doing workshops where we can play with um, different concepts and figure out what do we want to test before we invest, right? And so that's really where we get into smart innovation and thinking through what we're going to build and how we will build it. And the reason we want to do that is to keep cost within scope and within budget. Any questions? Uh, no, no. Uh, well, Maybe I have a question. Uh, do you do you have does any of your clients uh, live in Haiti, or do you only deal with uh, with folks in the U.S.? So so far, all of our clients are pr primarily in the U.S. with mm -hmm. our partners and talent partners in Haiti. Okay. So we work with designers in Haiti as well as different development teams. Cool. All right, so I'll dive in. So mm -hmm. remote team. Um, a lot of the clients that I've worked with had a desire to keep engineering costs as low as possible. And one of the ways to do that is by forming blended teams. And so that's a mixture of onshore U.S. resources and offshore resources. Um, one of the first projects where I had to work with a blended team, there was a lot of resistance actually from the U.S. side. They complained about communication, they complained about time zones, and it was my job to figure out how to help them see the value, and not only see the value, but actually see the benefit of collaborating with onshore teams. And so some of the things that I helped them figure out were, you know, being able to collaborate with um, teams like, you know, located in Haiti, you're able to not only create economic prosperity for a country, a, a developing country, but also creating jobs for really, really talented people. Two, we all know that diversity and inclusion is critical for all of us to be able to have, you know, broaden horizons, to be able to have, you know, more information when it comes to perspective. Um, and so basically after a couple of weeks of training those teams, I finally got that U.S. team on board with, with working with the remote team. Now, it wasn't a team in Haiti. The first international project I worked on was with a group in India. And so mm -hmm. that was very difficult because there was a 12-hour time zone gap um, that presented some challenges. And so I really had to work with both teams to figure out how do we meet in the middle. And so the good thing is, being in Haiti, you guys are already on U.S. time zone. So we don't have the same sort of challenges. But there are some other challenges that we'll go through throughout this workshop. Sure. Okay. And so some of the things that we'll cover today. Challenges that remote teams face on both sides. So we'll talk about on onshore and offshore. Um, effective collaboration. What are some things that we can do to overcome some of those challenges proactively? How do we apply those things? A couple of key points. And then I'll end with a partnership program that we offer so that if you guys are looking for work um, in the U.S., we can start talking about how we can get you trained in Scrum and how we can get you ready to work with U.S. teams. So some of the challenges with working with bl blended teams. The number one challenge that I commonly hear um, are communication and cultural gaps. And so one thing that I found spending time in the U.S. and spending time in Haiti, in the U.S., they like to move very, very fast um, at a pace that sometimes is not always reasonable. Um, and that's just a cultural thing. They're used to waking up and starting their day at seven or eight in the morning and maybe going until five in the evening um, and, and just constantly being nonstop. 
some of the challenges that we found in the beginning were the team in Haiti was not used, the teams in Haiti were not used to strict schedule where the beginning of the day, you start off with a scrum meeting where everybody has to dial in um, and talk about their day. I don't know if you guys have participated in scrum meetings yet, but there's a stand up meeting that happens usually Monday through Friday every day. And each team member dials in like we are now and they talk about what they did yesterday. They talk about what they're going to do today and they talk about where they're blocked. And so helping the team in Haiti get comfortable with this exercise was really critical because I will say this part of the culture here in the U S is very micromanagement. They want to understand what their team members are doing constantly. And the better you communicate, the less stress you'll have with someone constantly looking over your shoulder or tapping on you, asking for an update. Okay. Effective collaboration requires communicating with your team members often. So I don't know if you guys are using Slack or Google Hangouts or what sort of communication tools you're using, but the best thing to do is over communicate, ask questions. Be honest and transparent about maybe being stuck on something. It's much better to say, Jackie, I know I was supposed to be done with this task yesterday, but I'm actually having a tr trouble. Can I talk to you about it? And maybe we can figure it out together versus Jackie having to reach out to me tomorrow and I've already missed my deadline. <laughs> so effective collaboration is critical and it requires over communication. Even if you feel like maybe I've re I'd rather someone repeat themselves, right, than give me zero communication at all. The perception in the U.S. is if someone's not communicating back, they're not working, they're lazy, they don't have good work ethic. But they I know that that's not true. I know that that's not true, but it requires communication to prove otherwise. And that was one of the greatest challenges we had when we first started this partnership. The feedback was, they're not communicating with us. They're not telling us when they're stuck and maybe they're afraid to share. Right. And so that was one of my goals was to help the team feel confident in their voice. Okay. And so that leads us to this next section, be confident with your words mm. and to find confidence in your voice. You know, what helps is research and discovery. So typically, if I have a question, before I ask someone, one of the things I'll do is I'll exhaust all my options. Let me do research. Let me try to find the answer first so that before I ask my question, I've already covered my basis. Because one of the challenges you'll find is if you ask a question and the answer is obvious, there's going to be some friction. The developer is going to respond or the manager is going to respond and say, well, Becca, did you read the story? Did you read the user story? Because if you read the user story, the question that you're asking me, the answer is there, right? And so if I've done my research to discover the answer before I ask a question or share a point of view, I can be more confident with my words because I already did the research to figure it out on my own. Any questions about this piece? Because I think this is a very, very important um, topic and it's something that we've 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 put a lot of time and effort in to help the team improve with. Sure. Uh, this is Jackie. Two things. Is a scrum, is it something that you need to the IT industry or do you do they use it in other environments? They use it in other environments, um, but mostly so mostly software. Mostly, mostly software. software. So Scrum is a flavor of agile. So agile is universal. Agile is used for manufacturing, operation, almost in any industry uses agile for operation management, right? Yeah. Service delivery. Um, Scrum is a more tailored flavor to software development. I see. And uh, second question, you touch on, on uh, the fact that folks in the U.S. were telling you that uh, the folks in Haiti were not, they were not asking the the right questions or they just didn't ask questions at all. How do you think, how much do you think English or language play in a, a part in this? I think language can play a part, but a lot of communication is also done through Slack, 
mm. and Google Hangout, right? Which can help with the language barrier because now you just have to type your response, right? Instead okay. of having to speak it out loud. Um, and so, but I will say this, I mean, the teams have done very, very well communicating with one another because they are asking questions. Mm -hmm. The feedback was before someone saying, I'm stuck on something, right? During the next stand up or the next meeting and the manager's confused because their question wasn't asked. So how can you be stuck, but you didn't even ask me a question. So speaking up, it's okay to not know something. It's okay to be stuck. It's better to be transparent and say that so that everyone has the right expectation. Good question. Is John, John, I think you have a network problem. Yes. John. Uh, can can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear yes, you, John. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. You trended in the remote team about um, Agile, standoff, uh, scrum meetings, uh, all these things. Exactly. We went through training so that they could understand what meetings and cadences were expected, how to look at okay. the tools, right? The tools that we're looking for tasks. We okay. use Jira. Are you guys familiar with Jira? Yeah, I use Jira for my work. I use Scrum. I do standoff, all these things. Uh, okay. What about Sprint in terms of Sprint? So, I typically, how many weeks? Typically, we see two two week sprints is the normal standard for most of the teams that I've I've worked with. Um, they okay. like a two week sprint so that the product owner has a, a demo every two weeks and they can see progress and give feedback early. Okay, so so you kind of like you are the proxy between the local team and the remote team. There you go. Uh, do you? Are you a product owner also sometimes? Yeah, I serve as product owner. You play that role? I, I serve as product owner, product manager, project manager, scrum master. Okay. You do everything? <laughs> yeah. I got, I got you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, of course. And so I definitely want everyone to, some of the things that helps with um, confidence with your words is practicing, practicing with friends, um, you know, using your buddies, you know, if you have a question before you ask um, the remote team member, maybe ask one of your team members that, that, are, that are in Haiti as well. And you guys can talk it through before you ask the team, um, the, the team in the U.S. I really like to hone in on the focus is on people. So at the end of the day, we're all trying to build something together right? And communication is needed. So when you think about how, what would be most helpful for my team members or my manager or my clients or my stakeholders, that will help you identify what you should share. So if you know your stakeholder or your client or your manager is working towards a deadline and the work that you're doing or the task that you're doing is dependent on that deadline, it might be helpful for you to share if there's any issues, if you run into a, um, something that might block your work and that would impact that deadline. Um, so one of the greatest challenges we'll have here is the team really likes to prove how great they are, which they are amazing, but they, they forget that they're just human. We're all human and it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to be behind. It's, a, it's much better to communicate that because it's more helpful because if I'm the project manager and my developer tells me, hey, Beck, I know I'm supposed to have this task done at the end of the, the sprint, but I've run into a weird issue. I'm doing research, trying to figure it out, going to the tech community to find answers, but I wanted to let you know. The fact that he let me know gives me time and enough notice that I can get creative on what to do next. But if he tells me on the day that it's due that it won't be there, I have no room for damage control. I have no room for risk mitigation. I have no time. And so when you think about how, how should I communicate, what should I communicate, focus on the people. What would be helpful for your team members to know? What would be helpful for managers to know? What would be helpful for clients to know and stakeholders? 
And if you focus on the people that you're working with, it makes it a lot easier to know what and how to communicate. Does that make sense? Yes, definitely. Okay, great. Any questions about this piece? Mm, no. Okay. So I'll kind of reiterate some of these things that we've talked about. So a few tips for communication. We talked about doing research, right? So read existing documentation. So we'll go through a couple of example questions that are good to ask. Um, but one of them is, are there any tech docs or are there any API docs, right? So if you're working on a new feature or new, working on a new task, especially if it's back end, one intelligent question that you can ask before you even start that work is, are there any documents that I can review that will support this work? Um, another good practice is searching the web. There's a lot of helpful information. So if you're doing a new language for the first time, maybe you're used to JavaScript and now you're going to try Node.js, right? Look at videos, go to YouTube, and use your resources to get familiar so that when it's time to talk about that feature with the team, you already have some information. You've already done some homework, and now you're going to be dangerous during that conversation because you're going to know what to ask, you're going to know what to share, and you may even have ideas around architectural strategy or implementation. Okay? That leads me to the next one, share ideas. A lot of times I've had to encourage and motivate the teams in Haiti to speak up. And this could be going back to your point, Jackie, the, the you know, fear of you know, speaking English. But honestly, Hash and John Gerard, I don't know if you guys are familiar with some of these guys, they have done a great job and they found their voice by speaking up. In the beginning, they were very quiet. But now yeah. they're to the point where they are confident saying, you know what, we should try this. They're telling dev managers in the U.S., these are people that are their managers mm -hmm. telling them, actually, I think we should try it this way. Or, you know, I did some research and I found this, maybe we should explore it. Yeah. This helps them with credibility and it also has helped them retain. I mean, the, the projects that we're on, they've, these clients are renewing now, some of them over two years. John yeah. Gerard and Hash have been on one of my client's projects for two years. Mm -hmm. They renew. Nice. So that shows you the value, right? Obviously these U S companies, see the value but it comes from the fact that they do research they share ideas they ask questions right so after they do their own research first and they talk to their team members then they ask questions to the team in, mm -hmm. in the US. And also they can hide behind slack exactly slack <laughs> is a great great tool for great, that great tool yeah absolutely uh, absolutely before you move, you move forward, uh, Becca, are there particular websites you found useful that uh, you could probably suggest, or maybe you could make a make up a list for us and share? Absolutely, for for um, team collaboration specifically. Yes. Yes, yeah. I can definitely do that. I'll share also, the also research research as well. Absolutely, I can definitely oh, do that. And also, Jackie, I can add. Uh, it's gonna be, it depend on the project also. Yeah, so it depends okay. on tech stack, but there are some good general. Yeah. Um, there are some good general tools that you can use just to look for information. Um, to be honest, Google works just fine too. Like if I type in React Native and the component I'm having an issue with, GitHub. The, yeah, everything's gonna come up pretty yeah. easily. Okay. GitHub, uh, Git, GitHub has a lot of stuff also. <laughs> exactly. GitHub has a lot of information. Yeah. And then to me, the most important piece of all of these are actually listening. And so the key to communication is actively listening. So when you're participating in a stand-up meeting, when you're participating in planning meetings, making sure that you're listening for you know, notes, important information, or anything that's going to be relative to the work that you're doing and you're going to be assigned. Okay, So listening with intention is very, very, very important. So I love this data point. 90% of remote team challenges are caused by communication gaps. And I like to highlight this because this is a problem that can be solved very easily. And so right now we're in the virtual war world with COVID, right? So a lot of us are doing virtual meetings like Zoom or we're doing Slack and text 
um, or WhatsApp. And so because of that, it's very important to get familiar with those tools and even learn shortcuts and tips that can help you. And so some of the things that we're doing in the US are we're exploring Slack as a assistant project manager. So there are some um, third party tools that allow us to do a virtual stand up with Slack. So it'll pop in your um, Slack message. It'll say, what did you do yesterday? And you just type what you did. And then the next question will automatically come to you. What do you do today? You type what you did. And then the last question will be, are you blocked or are you stuck on anything? And you answer. <laughs> and so it's like, a, it's like having stand up over the phone or over video, but it's all through Slack. And there's a Slack bot, a robot, that mm -hmm. does it all for you. And so getting familiar with those tools helps because now you don't have to have someone remember to start the stand up. It's already programmed within Slack automatically. And the great thing is that tool also gives you a report. So you can see at the end of the day what everybody's response was, what all the team members are working on, et cetera. Wow. I'll share that tool with you guys too, because I think they have a free trial and then there's a paid version, but it may be worth exploring. Okay. Cool. Cool. And then virtual meetings. And so one of the things that I've had to help the team with um, in Haiti, in uh, the new code team, is around making sure they're aware of their calendar. And so you want to turn on your notifications and your reminders because it doesn't look good if you join a meeting either late or you don't show up at all. <laughs> the perception there is that this person doesn't care, they're not engaged, or they have something more important to do. And it puts me in a tough spot because I have to figure out how do I protect my team, right? Because I know they're great and I know they're probably just working. They just forgot to see the calendar. Mm -hmm. How do I protect them, but also honor my client? My client's feedback is valid. Hey, this person didn't join stand up today. Do they not care? Do they not want to work with us? Are they, un are they not interested anymore? Right. And so to, to help the team with this, I told them to turn on their notifications, make sure they always have their calendar up and that they're always on time and prepared for meetings because this is a big perception of work ethic. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any questions about virtual meetings and communicating virtually? I was, was going to ask you, uh, you know how you talk about making sure that they, they on time and they respond. Now I was going to ask you how engaged or slash responsible you feel you are, uh, to the success of the Haiti team. Do you feel like, you know, they, <laughs> they're on your team, you have to protect them, you have to defend them. How has it been for you? Absolutely. I will always defend my team in Haiti. Absolutely. I mean, that's my team first. Mm -hmm. That's my team first. Because that's who I'm serving, right? That for me, in my perspective, I am serving the team in Haiti and I want them to succeed. But I need the relationships with these clients in the U.S to have those opportunities. Okay. Right, so I'm in the middle. I have to make the clients have yeah, any less. It's a tough spot, because uh, they, yeah, they, may, they may at some point get the impression that, well, you know, Becca is there to uh, defend us. Maybe we, <laughs> we don't need to, to do too much. Cause she, you know, well, she, the well, the good thing is, the reality is behavior has consequence. So That's I can true. only protect them for so long. So we have also had some unfortunate situations where team members have lost opportunities. Mm. Where we've had US companies come and say, hey, we really like this person's work, but they're, they're, they don't communicate. We don't know what they're working on. I see. And that's unfortunate. That's always heartbreaking for me because I know the talent is there, which is why I have to spend so much time on this part, right? A lot of times the feedback isn't oh, we're not happy with the way they code, or oh, we're not happy with their, their development skills. It's never that. It always goes back to there's not enough of communication, not joining meetings, those sorts of feedback. Mm -hmm. so, so you manage the remote team. So Correct. Okay, do you have a local, for example, a local lead person down there? In Haiti? Yes. Yes, yeah, so Ted. Wherever you have, yeah, wherever yeah. you have, okay. And then yeah. also, do you run maybe a weekly meeting on top of this, this scrum? Yeah, the so scrum, there's... The scrum usually is like the whole team. It's, the, it's both the U.S. as well as the 
the remote team together joining doing the, the stand up uh, meeting and then doing the scrum uh, uh, planning uh, perspective. So what about uh, team management, like team meeting? Do you do that? Do you do team meeting every week? So Ted is doing internal team meetings with the developers. Um, I don't think it's, it's probably more frequent than weekly, okay. um, but he's doing a good job of making sure they have internal sessions outside of the client meetings. Okay, fine. Which is good. Thanks. They also do, um, they also do learning. So all the developers on the team, weekly, they demonstrate and they teach something new of the class, which is great because it helps with communication if I'm able to teach you something, I probably know that subject pretty well, right? And so it's a good practice for them to, to go through because they're able to teach their peers, but also confirm their own education. So they right? do the over food. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Lunch and learn. Lunch and learn, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, they do lunch and learns, they do code reviews, they do demos, and they do, they do um, different teachings. So that's helpful. You know, I, I encourage maybe we look at, you know, maybe putting a program together where everybody has a chance to participate. Maybe we assign, you know, small little projects where people have to present because okay. even though it's uncomfortable, once you do it a couple of times, it gets easier and easier and you get better as you go. But if you Sorry. avoid it, you'll always be uncomfortable. Sorry. So maybe we'll look at that, uh, Jackie. I, I could see us putting something together where we have everyone practice presenting. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and so we kind of talked about this, but I want to make sure I highlight, like, it's, it's okay to ask for clarity, right? And so one of the things you'll find in software are product owners are not always clear on the, what they want, but it's up to the development team to force the product owner or the product manager to provide clear requirements, okay? So it's okay to say, let's just give an example. Let's say a customer says, I want you to build a calendar for the app, right? It's okay to say, okay, do you want to use an integration for that? Do you want us to build something custom? You know, I need more information. And really you want to get to the point where you have acceptance criteria. Are you guys familiar with acceptance criteria? No, I am not. Okay. So acceptance criteria, if I, if I give you a task, the acceptance criteria allows you to know, are you building what I asked for, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And so some acceptance criteria could be, if we're talking about a calendar, the calendar should allow you to invite guests. One question could be, is that unlimited, right? Or is it capped? Is it five guests? Is it one guest? Um, should the calendar provide reminder, right? Should there be a reminder notification with the calendar invite? Um, that would be a question to ask. Um, another question could be, um, you know, are you doing a list view calendar or a calendar view, right? Because those are two different things. And so understanding what the client or the product owner is really asking for is critical. Or you could go off and build something that's not what they want. And then now you've done wasted effort and now you have someone who's unsatisfied, right? Um, usually another now, good, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, usually nowadays, now the product owner will write the spec. The spec should have all these information. Exactly. But I will say this, the, the, even though they provide specs, we often find that they miss things. Developers are really good at finding holes in requirements, which is great. That's what we should be doing. We should be challenging those requirements. Did you think through this? Did you think through that? Because oftentimes you'll find people in the product role because they don't live in the code, right? There are things that they would miss that wouldn't be obvious. Oh. Right? So it's good for developers to ask, well, how is this gonna impact? You know, let's look at risk mitigation. Let's look at you know, maybe putting a prototype so we can test and validate before we build out this feature completely. Um, and so it's really good to, before you even start the work, making sure that there's clear requirements and that's going to be found in the acceptance criteria. Okay. Now, not all shops do that. I will say this, you know, there are some shops that some development shops or companies that don't, they don't go to the depth of, of, of writing out acceptance criteria. And so if that's the case, it's just good to get that clarity for yourself if you're assigned a task 
and there isn't any acceptance criteria. Okay. Excellent. All right, so we kind of touched on some of this earlier, um, but it's important, depending on what project and the company that you're working with, to be available during specified business hours. So here on the projects that we're working with um, the team in Haiti right now, our hours are 9 to 5 p.m. So the expectation is when the development manager logs in on Slack, he would be able to see the team have their green light that they're available and online, right? Now, of course, we need work-life balance. One of the tricky things about COVID right now is we're all staying at home. We're all staying behind a computer for long hours at a time. So it's imperative to also make sure that you're thinking about taking your 30 minute to hour lunch break, that you're taking breaks to you know, walk and that sort of thing. But make sure that during the times that the team expects you to be available, you are, okay? Mm -hmm. And if you're not going to be, just communicate. It's very, very simple. I need to take the afternoon off. I'll be honest, the teams here are very, very flexible. They just require communication. So you can even tell them, I'm not feeling well today. I think I'm going to take the, the rest of the day off. No one's going to question that. What they will question is if you disappear and you said nothing to anyone. Very important. Right. And so yeah. really thinking through, you know, what are the business hours? How long did I take lunch? Am I going on an hour and a half, which I probably shouldn't do unless it's a special circumstance and I've already talked to someone on the team about that. But this is very, very important because the perception here is if I don't see you online, I assume that you're not working, right? And if I see that you haven't been online for three hours and there was no communication, I may have a concern. That may break our trust. Now I may feel like I can't trust you, right? Yeah. And so this is a very easy thing for all of us to be able to do, just making sure we're looking at business hours. If we do need to schedule personal meetings, making sure we communicate that with our managers or project managers, whoever you're working with, so they're aware and they know what to expect. So is it a, a normal uh, week schedule, Monday to Friday? For the most part, yeah. You have to work on weekends sometimes. Yeah, most of our clients are Monday through Friday only, 9 to 5. Okay. That's pretty typical. Um, we, we very rarely will ever ask someone to work on the weekend unless we're doing some sort of migration that would be disruptive during the week. Um, so if we need to coordinate like an evening or weekend migration, we'll do that. But that's very, very rare. Okay. So human-centered collaboration. Working with remote teams can actually be very, very fun. Um, you get to learn a lot about different people from different parts of the world and build relationships. And so some of the things that help with communication are making sure that you're asking the right questions. So we talked about making sure that we're thinking about what would be helpful for my team, what would be helpful for my manager, what would be helpful for my client to know. This is an example of building a new feature. So if I'm in a meeting and we're doing discovery on building a new feature, there are some questions that would be obvious to me. I need to think about who's going to use that feature, right? Because depending on who's going to use it, that's going to change the way we build it. That's going to change the way we design it. That's going to change the way we make it available in the UI, right? So it's good to understand from the product owner's perspective, product owner, who do you expect to use this feature? And what is the purpose of that feature? Right? It's really good to have a good understanding versus them just saying, Jackie or Becca or John, I want you to build this feature, but you have no context. You don't know why you don't know the purpose. For me personally, I don't feel comfortable building without knowing the why, right? It's very, very important for me to understand that because knowing the why will help me determine the best way to implement that feature, okay? Another good question to understand would be, how are they gonna use it? And the reason you wanna understand this is because you have to think through, how do we test this? How do we test it to see that it met the requirement and that it actually works? We've gotta be able to validate that whatever we built is usable. And so making sure you understand how that user is going to use that specific feature or function 
is critical. Go ahead. Do you think? Do you think in that case it would be good for developers to ask for some user cases if they are in the available? Absolutely, I think that's appropriate. Yeah. Um, it, it's supporting. It's supporting. Usually, if you have, and some teams have a full time UX UI designer, right? So, if you have a full time UX UI designer, hopefully, they're building all the wireframes and a prototype. So you have a visual mm -hmm. of what's expected, right? But in the case where maybe it's a back-end feature and there really isn't any UI or whatever the case is, this becomes very, very important because, of, of course, it's going to be exposed in the UI in some way, but maybe all you're building is an API gateway or an integration on the back-end. And so you have to understand how do we create test data, how do we test this to validate that whatever the expectation was, was met. Another good question is what will they use it for? So understanding why the user will perform that function or feature will help us even with the solution. If we know why and, and how they will use it, then we can determine what is the best, simplest, and most effective way to implement it. Sometimes it can be simpler than we think, right? As long as you're asking these questions. But when you don't ask these questions, you may go out and build a very complex thing and it didn't need to be complex or the reverse. Maybe you build something very simple, but it doesn't meet the need, which was a bit more complex. And then the most important question is, does that feature solve their problem? Right? So whatever we execute, whatever we build, we've got to validate that it actually solves the problem or the use case. And so thinking through these questions during discovery, during workshops with the team and even asking them out loud, is a very, very good practice. Um, and I encourage everyone, if you guys are in these sort of collaborative sessions, to be asking these sorts of questions, okay? Now, these are more on the product and discovery user experience side. Um, to go into more technical questions, so if I'm a developer and a team member or a manager assigns a new task for me or a new implementation, a good question to ask, depending on what the, the feature is, is there a reference template? And the reason this is a good question to ask is because there may be a pattern that exists that should be followed, right? And so, for example, some companies write most of their services as microservices. And so if they're asking of, of a feature where maybe there's an existing microservice that can be used, then it would be good to ask that question ask that there's a reference implementation or a reference template that can be used before you start that work. Any questions about this piece? Uh, no, no, pretty okay. good. Another question that you wanna ask is how will we test and validate? So we talked about this a little bit earlier, but this is very, very, very important because we found that there are times when this is missed and no one thinks about testing and validation. So the team will execute all this work and effort, and then we get to the point where it's time to test and the QA team cannot test. Whether it's there's no test data available, whether it's we didn't think about how this could be tested in a QA environment, right? Because normally you're doing testing and staging or in QA, not in production. And so if this question is not asked from the beginning, you may find yourself wasting a lot of time and effort building something and getting to the point where it can't even be tested or there needs to be more work to actually make it testable. Mm -hmm. Okay. We touched on this a little bit earlier, but I will hone in on this again, API documentation. So if you're doing a new integration or a third party sort of implementation, you always want to ask the product owner or the dev manager, for access to the API docs, or even a sandbox. So some of the integration tools out there, they have a, a sandbox that you can use and you can start playing with and you can start testing the endpoints and seeing how it works and getting a response back. But without documentation, it's almost like you're going in blind, right? And so it's good to ask before you're given a, a complex API sort of task, are there documentation or is there documentation available for me to read over? Okay. And then the last question 
Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the concept of tech spike, but really this just means research task. So if I'm assigned a new um, bulk of work or a new assignment, before I do that work, one good thing to demonstrate my capability and also the fact that I'm really thinking about what I'm doing would be to perform a, a spike. And so doing that research allows me to come back to my development manager or to my scrum master or my project manager and say, hey, Becca, I'm thinking that after doing this research, this might be a good way for to, us to implement and test this feature or this implementation. Um, and so tech spike, just think of it as a research task. So even though you may think that you know how to build it, it doesn't hurt to spend a little time doing research and kind of figuring out, does this approach make sense? And development managers appreciate that because it gives them a chance to collaborate with you before anything is even built. So they can see in advance how you're thinking about implementation, how you're thinking about you know, developing that feature out so that it can be tested by, by a QA. Any questions about some of the technical questions and examples that I shared here? I'm good. Excellent. All right, so making things happen. At the end of the day, software development is super, super exciting. Um, it's inspirational because you get to be a part of the solution based on whatever challenge it is that you're solving. You also get to think out of the box and share ideas. And so the, my favorite part of software development is we're in, when we're in the discovery and planning phases, when we're figuring out all the possibilities of how we can bring an idea to life. And then getting to the implementation phase, right? And so getting to a point where we either build a prototype very quickly so that we can gather feedback from product owners, stakeholders, clients very, very quickly. And so all of these things help with solidifying communication because we're making things positive with inspiration, we're being collaborative with ideation, and then we're figuring out how we're actually going to execute with implementation. But we, before we build, we wanna get that feedback quickly. And so prototypes help with that, you know, even things like having a mock-up with some documentation, like this would be my approach. Um, and so writing a RFP, or I'm sorry, an RFI, RFI would be request for information. So you write up all the things that you want to do to implement this feature and you allow the team to give you feedback before any code is actually built. Okay. And so these are some best practices just for thinking about, you know, how to look at the positive sides of collaborating with teams. And that's really the inspiration, the ideation, and the implementation and bringing all these things together to build cool products. Mm -hmm. So a couple of important points. Working with remote teams presents obviously lots of challenges, but there are also things that we can overcome just from effective collaboration. So if we take some of the things that we talked about earlier, these are the results. So if I'm effectively collaborating with my team, if I'm showing up to meetings on time, and not just on time, but also with the intent to listen very clearly and collaborate with my team members, I'm already helping my team increase productivity because we're having the right conversations. We're getting through the weeds of any confusion we're figuring out if we're all on the same page very early. And because of that, we're able to improve the user experience. So because we're having the right communication, the right collaboration, we can improve what we're building for the users because we have more knowledge. We've honed in on what the goals are for that user experience or for that user interaction. And because we've collaborated and we've communicated effectively, we can add benefit to the user experience and improve that overall. And it makes everybody's life simpler. So communication Absolutely. may seem like a challenge. It may seem like, oh, I wish I didn't have to, but it really does make everyone's life easier. It makes your life easier because now you're more informed, right? Then it also makes your team members' lives easier, easier because you're sharing timely and meaningful information with them, which they need.
there's always room for improvement. Even myself, I've been doing this now for 10 years and I still have to practice communication. Um, I do it in different ways. Sometimes I may sign up for um, different trainings. Udemy has great um, classes. I don't know if any of you guys are using Udemy. Yes. Udemy, great. Use Udemy. They have a lot of free classes that you can take advantage of. Just type in, you know, communication or improving communication and you can take some of those classes. Some of the other things that help are just talking to people, your friends, family members, your colleagues, people that you work with. Get in the habit of practicing your communication just by doing it. That's the best way to practice. Um, and there's no shame in asking for feedback. So one of the things that's helped me in my career is I'm constantly asking for feedback. So even at the end of this presentation, when we all go back to our lives of whatever we were doing before this, I'm going to send Jackie an email and I'm going to ask him for constructive feedback so that I'm improving myself to be able to improve when I'm working with others. Okay. And so always be thinking about how can I get better? And a lot of that is just practicing and asking for feedback. Don't be afraid. If anything, people have more respect for people that ask for feedback then people that think they've got it all together or they think that they don't need any feedback or there's no room for improvement because i'll tell you guys now self-improvement is a lifelong journey and for those of us that are committed to that we will always be in improvement mode because that's important to us and it's important that we're also spreading that to others as well any questions or comments on the feedback loop uh, very important, uh, and that Haitian culture, we tend not to ask questions because people may think <laughs> we're not smart. So what has been your experience? Yep, no, I've seen that. So I've had to help the team find a voice. And so some of the things that help with that are remember doing my research, talking to my own team members first before I ask questions or ask for feedback. Mm -hmm. Right. And so making sure that I'm doing that helps me be more confident because I've already received some feedback from my peers. They've already maybe given me some constructive criticism. Right. Which criticism is good. We need that without criticism. Think about all the successful companies in the world. They all have criticism and that criticism has helped them improve their communication, their operation, whatever those those avenues are. And so feel and confident you're, and it's, you're talking, and it's even, okay. you're talking about even non-constructive criticism. Of course. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so one of the things that I think would be helpful and it's been helpful for me mm. is to just be confident in yourself and transparent. So if I can say, Jackie, this is not easy for me to say but I really want to get better. So even though I'm not comfortable, I'm going to, I'm, I want to, I'm going to overcome my fear and I'm going to ask you for constructive feedback. I'll tell you that because I was that transparent with Jackie, Jackie's going to take what I said to heart because I was honest with him. I said, Jackie, this is actually not comfortable for me. I'm not very comfortable with this, but I want to get better and I need your help. I'll be honest with you guys, people like to help people, especially when you're open about the fact that you do want help and you wanna get better. It's almost like it'll become my responsibility. Jackie will feel responsible for helping me because he hears the sincerity in my voice. He sees, okay, Becca really wants to get better. She wants to improve in this area. I wanna to contribute to her growth. And now it becomes personal for him. Sure. A lot of times we think we have to prove ourselves. We think we have to, you know, be all these things, but really just show up as yourself and be transparent because people care about your why more than anything. So if I know why Jackie wants to do the work that he's doing, it was a no brainer when he asked me to join him on this journey. There was no way I was going to say anything, but yes, because I understand his why he wasn't afraid to ask for help. And he was honest with me about where he is in his process. Right. Yeah. And that allows us to connect as human beings. That's all communication is, connecting as human beings. So don't be afraid to show who you are. People will connect with that better than trying to pretend you're this or that. If, if you don't have confidence, it's okay to say, you know, I'm working on my confidence. I'm not there yet, yeah. so bear with me. 
I'll tell you right now, we have so many calls and I love that Hash does this. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Hash. His name is Ho uh, Holly, um, but he goes by Hash. Okay. And Hash has no problem before we, he answers a question. You, got, you guys know I'm still working on my English, so bear with me. And we all <laughs> smile with him. We yeah, smile well, with him. Well, just accept him. And, we, and, they, and none of my clients have ever complained. They love Hash. <laughs> Some of my clients, they say we, we want to keep Hash forever because he's honest. He's transparent. He doesn't try to be something he's not. He's still yeah. developing, right? But he does great work and he's not afraid to speak up, ask questions and be honest. This is very important, yeah. Very, very important. And so ask for help. If I wanna get better, I can't do it on my own. I have to be able to ask for feedback and help or even suggestions. And you'll find that people do really wanna help, but you have yeah. to be open and transparent to receive that help. Sure, sure. Okay. And so I'm going to show you guys just a sample discovery collaboration. So let's say we were all on the call to build something new. Maybe we're going to work on a new app. One of the first phases of that collaboration is going to be just to kick off to discuss whatever the product goal or feature is. So that first conversation is really just about understanding what the goals are for that feature. We're not even thinking about how to build it just yet. We're just thinking about where we're trying to go with the user. Okay. And so this is just a high level conversation. It's good for you to ask questions in these conversations. There's nothing wrong with cont um, contributing to the collaboration, even if you're not a designer. Oftentimes I find that designers do better when they have developers that are thinking about the user experience that are thinking about the design. And it helps the design get better because now developers can contribute to whatever the designer was thinking about. Okay. The next phase after we kick off the product goal and figuring out what we're trying to do is to understand how we're going to do that. And that comes with the research of API documentation, understanding the tasks. And so the product owner may give us user stories, right? He may say the product owner may give us a story that says, as a user, I want to schedule a calendar meeting, right? And so that story doesn't give us any task. It just gives us the story. So it's still our job to figure out how to read through any existing documentation and then identifying the tasks that would be needed and working with the team to ask the right questions, to give feedback, to give suggestions on, hey, I think this would be a good implementation. What do you think? and getting that feedback and then refining what you've come up with based on that feedback and the communication that you received. And then the last phase is basically before you do any coding is making sure there's some sort of high level overview of the solution based on that acceptance criteria that we talked about. And so all of these phases are just communication. No coding is happening yet. We're talking about things, we're researching, we're documenting, we're sharing ideas, we're exchanging information so that when we get to the point where it's time to develop and code, we've had all the right conversations as a part of that discovery. Okay. Any questions about the discovery? I, again, this is very high level, so I didn't go into the weeds of these ceremonies, but I think that can be a future training. I'll talk to Jackie to see if that's something we can put together for you guys in the future. Sure, sure. No question for me. Excellent. All right. So I'd love to connect with you all. My information is here for email. You guys can visit the website. I'm also on Instagram. So I'd love for all of you to join our network, to connect with us. And I think this is something that we can look at as an ongoing series. You know, I can imagine there were some questions around scrum and agile maybe the next one is we dive into the methodology to actually deliver great products mm -hmm. and we could even go through a sample project right where we have a project and we actually go through the ideation phase maybe we even get to the point where we build a prototype or a wireframe together so that we can exercise our communication and collaboration skills so i would really like for us to do that i think if we can demonstrate and do it then we can all feel comfortable when we're doing it with other projects and other team members. 
Um, so I'm open to that, Jackie. If you guys want to look at that, right. later, I'm definitely, definitely open to that. As I said, well, uh, this is really the beginning of, of uh, a, a series of uh, conversations. I wanted to start with this uh, in the sense that I want to, you know, I want people to just prepare their minds to what's to come because uh, the uh, online work environment is different. You know, it, it has its own nature, its own uh, challenges. And I'm really glad we went through this uh, this afternoon. Uh, you're a woman, you're in tech. How many women you have on your Haiti team? We have three. Oh, okay. So, yes. Yeah, so it's growing. There's still a lot of room for growth. We're not quite at the 50-50 that we'd like to be in the future. Um, okay. but I'm glad to see that we have some women um, that are on the team and, and learning coding. Sure, sure. Well, uh, I don't know if there are questions. Uh, I have a question. Uh, do you have a question. I have a question. I'm all ears. <laughs> yes. Uh, so your team composes, uh, okay, do you have testers also as well? Yes, we have QA testers, developers. And again, so I work with partners in Haiti. So I have, I have three employees in the U.S that work with the BPrint on the product side. So they do product management, project management, and user experience. In Haiti, we basically outsource all of our development to the teams in Haiti. So they do all the back-end development, front-end development, web, mobile, platform, et cetera. Okay. So you use uh, the DevOps methodology? Correct. Okay, no waterfall? Um, strictly right now, it's all agile. Most of our customers are um, startups, and so they are used to the agile scrum methodology. So the two-week sprint cycle, um, you know, and kind of going through every two weeks, being able to do a demo, potentially a release. We don't always release every two weeks, but they like to release often. But that's also because some of these projects are for platform as a service products. Are you guys familiar with platform as a service? Yes, yes, yes. You and so are done. Yeah, and so when you think of platform as a service, there's a lot of components. There's the web UI piece, there's the mobile piece, there's a black, the core backend piece. Um, and so really the teams are driving the development practice for my clients. They're an extension of their team. So my clients have their own US teams and then the teams in Haiti are an extension of those teams. Mm -hmm. Well, I promoted everyone to panelists. Uh, so I'd like to see some faces on the on the screen. Maybe I'll stop. Uh, let's stop sharing. See if there's anyone. Uh, yeah, let's do it. Uh, hello, Coteno. Uh, I also yeah, plan yeah. on uh, we plan on starting a program where right now we have. Uh, I think uh, Jackie can help me. We had training on uh, WordPress. And then I think right now there's a team doing um, HTML and uh, CSS. Um, so for you, what do you think we should focus on, like in terms of, you know, like training, like if we, if we want to provide some trainings uh, to, to, to folks, should we focus on the on, uh, front end as well as back end or Python? Python is a great move. Um, I would say the hot languages right now are React Native. Yeah. React Native is hot right now because it supports iOS and Android mm -hmm. platforms, but it's a single code base. And so people appreciate that they don't have to build native iOS and yeah. native Android, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. React Native is big. Python is big because data science is becoming such a big um, such a big industry right now. So being familiar with Python is a great skill set to have, especially if you're looking and applying it to data science and research fields and that sort of thing. AI, everything. Yeah. Okay. I think a general full stack um, experience is good. So if you can do full stack, be familiar with the back end, be familiar with, with the front end, mm -hmm. and also have some mobile experience. 
Um, it makes you a lot more marketable. Um, and so a lot of the guys right now, the guys and, and girls right now, they are flexible. So even if they're assigned to the mobile, let's say that we finish all of our mobile responsibilities and now there's more back end work that's needed. They are versatile. They can actually be put on any team, whether it's front end, back end or mobile. Mm -hmm. And that's what you want. You want to be as marketable as possible. So, but it's yeah. also good. I will say this. It's also good. I don't want to discourage having specialties. It's very good to have a specialty as well. Right. And so it's good to know what is your core strength um, because that also helps with being marketable as well. Being, at, being yeah. able to say I'm an expert. Definitely. Right. Definitely. Yeah. Cause we were thinking about uh, full stack, like doing the front end, uh, back end, you know, running a bunch of uh, some database uh, tools. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think right now it's, it seems that the web is web application and mobile applications, you know, are pretty hot. So yeah, web and mobile are very very hot. Um, Python, as I said, and, and as you asked about it as well. Um, and then two, developer operations is actually still a very big, you know, info security, cyber security. I mean, these are things that aren't going anywhere anytime soon, right? The, the more the web grows, the more people have access to technology, sure. the greater the cybersecurity needs are, right? And so I'd love for some people to focus on that because I'll tell you right now, those are the highest paying jobs in the U.S., mm -hmm. cybersecurity. Get two people who are going to go And Dolly? Dolly, you have a question? Yes, yes, I do. Hello, hello. Uh, my name is Dory, and I'm pretty happy to be there with you. Thank you, Kathleen, for the insight and the tips. Um, I think on, on, on the screen that you showed us that um, I put that how we can apply. I, I don't know if, I, I don't think we, we really covered that. If you could, you know, just talk with us about that. But my question is, um, If any young people in Haiti want to, I mean, want to be part of your team in Haiti, how they can apply? How can they be a part of your team? Thank you. Absolutely. So what I'll do is when I send Jackie the follow-up email with the deck and the video, the video recording, I'll include a link to be able to apply for software development and QA jobs. Um, we are always open to it, looking over resumes. And as soon as we have new projects that match a skill set, we'll reach out and, and let you know that we're interested in, in pursuing um, a project. And so just so you guys know how it works, it's all project based, right? So it'll be, you come on for the project. Once that project is done, unless they want long-term support, then that project would be complete, right? And we'd wait for the next project to be available to get you assigned. Sure. Uh, next question is uh, Didley. Didley, you there? You're on mute. I think you need to do a, okay, go ahead. Okay, do you hear me? Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, I would like to congratulate and thank Becca for his presentation. So I was late because I'm still in, in my office, in my job. So that's why I was late. I would like to, to um, in order to congratulate Becca for his presentation. I don't have a question, but I would like to tell her if I, 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 I wish it's not the last time, the last presentation, and I hope next time I will be, I will be there. <laughs> You'll be on time. time. Yeah, I will be on time. Thank you so much. No worries. Hopefully you Great. did, hopefully you did join when I was talking about joining meetings on time. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, the good don't worry i'm gonna i'm gonna send this out so you guys will have the video so you can anything that you missed you'll have access to rewatch thank sure. you so much uh any more questions so i'm going to question so i'm going to be a little bit of 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 a little bit hello yes go ahead please yeah um Um, if if I can understand the B print website, maybe mm. can I ask um, Kathleen is if it's something like 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 a freelance freelance website? For example, we have Fever, we have freelance.com. I don't know if it's uh, it's like a, those website mm. or if it is different and in 
how it is different from, from this website? That's a great question. I would say similar, but we're like the concierge, right? Because we place you on the opportunities. Um, they're also guaranteed. A lot of them are going to be, um, a lot of them are going to be with, you know, U.S. small businesses or startups that have funding. Um, and so these aren't necessarily opportunities that you're working for an individual in a freelance capacity. You're actually working with a full development team and you're an extension of that team. Um, we also do offer side projects. And so some of the engineers are working with us on smaller projects where it's just an entrepreneur that has a budget and they need an app. And the team has the skill set to do that. And so with those smaller projects, it may just be one engineer working on it with a designer, maybe two engineers. Um, but we have both models. So we have the staff augmentation model. Staff augmentation would be when you're working with a bigger team. And then we have project base, which would just be, you know, the client telling us what they want us to build. And then we building that out for them. Okay. Any more questions? Any other question? I know that you've been working with, with Young Asian for, for the past I know, two or three years. Um, do you see any kind of, um, how can I say that? Do you see any kind of, 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 of see, quasas, uh, like more people, more young people, more young Asian involved in, in, in the project that you're doing for us and with us? Yeah, so just to give you guys my timeline, when I first started this, the first project we closed, they took one of our Haitian engineers. After the first three weeks, they were impressed and asked for a second. So then we got two. The next project that we got with a different client, they started off with one. A few weeks later, they asked for two. Then we ended up with six. So six engineers on that project working with the U.S. team. Um, and so it just depends. It varies. It depends on client need. It depends on, you know, what the client's looking for. Some clients, you know, they just want staff augmentation. And we have some clients that are entrepreneurs that they don't have a team. They don't have their own development team. So we become their development team, which is why when you guys ask, well, what roles do you play? Those clients, I have to be their product owner because they've never built an app before, right? They understand the business side and what they're trying to do from a business perspective but they may not be clear from the actual user requirements and the product perspective. All right. Um, a lot of great questions. Uh, so I, I ask you one of the things we're trying to do now is encourage young women to get into technology. Well, first to learn English. <laughs> it's, it's a fight. It's a, it's, a, it's a struggle in itself just to get them to go to an English class. Yeah. Uh, because a lot of them are really timid. They don't want people to laugh at them. So what, uh, what's your, what can you tell them? <laughs> you got to be fearless. Don't worry about what yes. others think. Fearless, right? So when you don't, when you eliminate ego, right? And you don't worry about the ego. A lot of times fear comes from the ego, right? When you eliminate ego and you say to yourself, what is it that I'm really trying to do? Give yourself a fair chance. Give yourself a fair chance. And so putting the ego to the side and focusing on whatever goal you have and saying nothing is going to get in my way. And a lot of times it's easier to laugh at yourself. If I laugh at myself, then we're going to just laugh together. You're not going to laugh at me because I'm already laughing at myself, right? <laughs> I have no problem saying paka pale. I'm honest about it. Instead of trying to butcher the language, I'm honest. I, I, you know, I'm working on it. I'm not good at the language yet, but I'm going to try. I'm going to work on it. And I want you to help me with that. Okay. And so I think when you're honest and just transparent about where you are and what you really want, people are willing to work with you. And people actually respect that more than someone who thinks they know it all, someone who thinks they're perfect at English or whatever the case is. Because I'll tell mm -hmm. you right now, I've come across Haitians that speak better English than Americans. Okay. And I'll just, I have no problem saying that. I have come across lots of Haitians that speak better English than Americans. And that's just because Haitian oh, people are resilient. I mean, most Haitians are speaking two, three, four languages already. Yeah. Right. And so that's another thing I tell my U.S. clients. Remember, you know English and that's it. 
these guys and girls know three, four languages. And they're always very impressed, like, wow, that's their fourth language or that's the third language. And that's how well, that's how fluent they are. And I say, Mm -hmm. yes, that's how fluent they are. So I wouldn't worry about, you know, if you let people get in your way, you're going to always put off your dreams. If I let confidence and fear and all these things get in my way, I'm just going to be sitting around not doing what I really want to do because I'm too afraid. I'm going to watch everybody else. I'm going to watch everybody else do it. Yep. Wow. So I think really just putting the ego to the side, that's a very important thing. And thinking about why are you doing it? Because when you focus on your why, you don't care about those barriers, right? You know that you want to make a difference in in Haiti or you want to have a better career or you want to have access to a better future. So that's why you're doing it. So it doesn't matter who's going to laugh. And we all are going to go through those things, right? You guys saw what Obama, you guys saw what, you guys saw what Obama went through to get to the yep. White House. Everybody was laughing at him. You think they let him mean? stop him? Yep. He didn't, he didn't let that stop him. So, you know, there's good examples for us to see of people who sure. are doing these things. Yeah, yeah. And they're not afraid of culture or language barrier or any of that. That's not going to stop them. All right. Are you seeing a trend to get more women to be in tech? Yep. I am focused on actually building women tech entrepreneurs. That is one of our focuses. So we've got six entrepreneurs we're working with right now that are all wanting to build mobile apps and web applications. So I'm Mm going to help them become black tech founders because they're all black women. Okay. Okay. So for a young 18, 20 year old uh, from the countryside of Haiti, uh, female, what would you tell them? And what are some of the opportunities that are out there for them to, to be hopeful about? I would say one of the things I love about tech is the sky is the limit, meaning you can build yourself up to be able to contribute to a great product or you can learn to build your own, right? And so a lot of the team members that are working with us right now, they're working for clients, but their end goal is to have their own business one day, to have their own product. And if you're able to build, think about all the challenges that we have, not only in the world, but let's just start with Haiti, right? If you can find a way to build something that improves a process or improves people's lives or gets them access to food, gets them access to water, uh-huh. technology helps us innovate, right? So any idea you have, you can learn a skill set that gives you the tools to actually build what you imagine. And that's the key to me. Like for me, that's what gets me so excited about technology is I can build solutions instead of complaining oh, we don't have this, or oh, we don't have this, or we have this problem. I'm the, person, I'm the person that thinks about, well, let's solve it. How do we solve it? What can we do? Right? And so for anyone in Haiti, you know, women, men, you know, young people, the sky is the limit. And right now, the world needs solutions, not just in Haiti, everywhere. I mean, some of the successful tech entrepreneurs that I'm seeing coming out of Haiti, they're not just solving problems locally. They're figuring out how to solve problems at a global scale, Mm -hmm. right? And I want people to start paying attention to Haiti as a real tech hub. And the way we do that is by teaching everyone else. That's what they're doing in Africa. Africa's doing a great job of that. They're now becoming the model and the standard where the rest of the world is looking at what they're doing. I want us to do the same in Haiti because we have the skill set. We have the skill set and we're in between the two. We're in between Africa. We're in between the, the U.S., the North Americas. Yeah, there's this uh, organization in Africa. I think it's called Un- Andela. Yep, Andela. Andela, yeah. I'm partnered with them. Yep. Oh, good, good. Yeah, it's it's being supported by Facebook and and some of the other good techs. Yeah. Then I keep I, I keep thinking, well, why can't we have at least a small version of <laughs> Andela in Haiti? We have a, a bunch of smart young people, you know, they eager to learn. Uh, we can build a lot of good things in Haiti. I agree. Actually. I, truly so I, think that's, I think that's in the works. I think right now we need to get all the people that are trying to do that together. That's probably the problem. Mm-hmm. We're not all, we're all trying to do it on our own. But if we all come together, now we're more powerful, right? We have more unified resource. Mm-hmm. So I think you're onto something with that. And I think, I think there is a movement toward that. Like Mark, you guys know Mark, he's doing his thing. Ted is doing Mark, his thing. Mark Ale, Mark Ale. Christine, yeah, Christine is doing her thing, right? 
but we need to be more unified. Sure. It's like we have different pockets of it, but we don't yeah, have yeah. a whole hub. So I think that's what's missing. I, I see we we actually we we took on the the, the, the countryside and, and you know it was a conscious decision. There's a lot of challenges operating outside of Port of Winds, but you know, we, we, we dived into it knowing well what, what the challenges are. Someone has a question. Uh, do they offer help with current schools, if any, in Haiti to teach kids how to code? I think they say, when, when that person said they, they refer to your organization. Yeah, and so we have some programs for kids where we've partnered with organizations that have no code and code camps. Mm. So some of the camps offer learning how to code without any coding. And then some of them offer where you actually do learn to code as a kid, whether using, um, if you guys are familiar with like Raspberry Pi mm -hmm. or some of these products where these kids can build their own computers, they can build their own applications, et cetera. Yeah, great. Uh, any more questions? Look up a post question in the chat. Yes, my question is par rapport avec the travail that Beka fait avec Tim Lusliant. Dans quelle mesure le travail ça l'inscrit dans le cadre de développement du Rabio par rapport avec la communauté qui l'a vécu, avec bon, l'humanité en général, dans quelle mesure le travail est utile et il est capable de contribuer dans le développement du Rabio Et maintenant, je vais vous dire. Maintenant, je vais vous dire. Est-ce qu'il y a quelqu'un qui a lié un travail qu'il a fait qui est capable de contribuer dans. Um, par exemple, ça n'est pas capable de les protection de Timoun. Comme si les Timoun grandissent dans le respect de Wayo et ils joignent ça qui est supposé jouer en fonction du cadre légal de la CAI. Mm. That's a long question. Did you understand any of that, Pekka? I heard travail. I know travail is work. <laughs> so I know it's something about work. <laughs> I may have him repeat the second part, but the first part has to do with how do you think what you're doing is part of the uh, overall United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Or which goal you think you're addressing by what you do? Yeah. Creating jobs. Yep. Building an ecosystem, right? It starts yeah. with Def no, definitely. And some de cas dit en plus tout, c'est que le fait que la travaille avec client et puis les gains développeurs, Maintenant, l'objectif clé autour, c'est sur des choses qui sont capables de promouvoir et de réaliser au DDO. Par exemple, si, si un client travaille lié à par exemple, c'est pour promouvoir l'égalité entre, entre les sexes. Le fait que l'entreprise et euh, Kathleen a aidé les clients à réaliser. Mon nom est Becca, pas Kathleen. Ah, oh, sorry, Becca. Parce que moi, ok, sorry, thank you. Donc, le fait que Becca ait de réaliser, ait des clients ça satisfait, maintenant, les clients ça mettez pour du ça dehors, pour du ça les voir satisfait, un objectif, en quelque sorte, ni yeah, yeah. de façon directe, ni, ni indirecte. Yeah, so, Dolly is saying, even though you don't, you're not directly addressing in your, uh, uh, you know, a particular goal, but through your clients, maybe you're working for clients who's, uh, Objective is to uh, reduce uh, or contribute to gender equality. So that's one way to really contribute to the uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, the second, part, mm -hmm. second part of your question, uh, did they have to do with uh, child, children rights, uh, helping children develop? How do you think you're contributing to that? Yeah, and so we not only work with children entrepreneurs, but we also help them with the educational piece as well, right? And so helping them learn. So I have two clients that are under the age of 10. Mm. They have their own business. We've built them apps. We've well, built them could websites. you say that again? Did, I, did have, I, did I have two okay. clients that are under the age of 10. One, she makes a um, coconut lip balm and, oh. and she also customizes it for like parties. You know, so somebody's getting wedding, uh, mm -hmm. somebody's getting married, she'll put the label of the wedding and that and everything like that. And then the other client, she's a um, she's an actress and a, um, a, a singer. So those are two clients that we've helped them build their brand. We help them go to market and now they have paid opportunities after working with us. Under 10 years old. Under 10 years old. <sighs> incredible. Incredible. Well. 
Thank you. Uh, any more questions? All right. I think uh, I think that'll be it for tonight. Uh, Becca, thank you very much. This is definitely not the last, and we hope to get you back here. We may not have uh, the type of coders or tech savvies that that can end us in all all the uh, APIs and all the different things that you guys discussed. But this was just a way for us to start getting people's minds in the right place as to what it requires when it comes to the uh, uh, online work environment. So thank you very much for taking the time to join us. We'll be in okay. touch and we'll definitely share this recording with folks and some of the links that you're gonna put together and a lot of other resources. Any final word? I have enjoyed being here with you all. Thank you so much for having me. And I look forward to contributing however I can. So please let me know what training you want me to put together. And I'm happy to put that together and, and we can go through some material in the near future. And if you guys have any questions, um, feel free to reach out. Uh, we want to be helpful. So if you're looking for opportunities, if you guys feel like you are ready for certain opportunities, um, get in touch with me and we can talk about how to get you on the path of working for some of my U.S. clients here. Uh -huh. okay. Definitely. Thank you. Let's end that with your slide, your, the final slide you had with your, your contact, your phone number and email. And we'll, yeah. we'll keep that up for another minute. Et puis, on juste dit tout le monde, et merci qui te rejoint nous. Après-midi, on pense que nous passons un bon temps ensemble là. Et ce n'est pas la dernière fois que nous rencontrer. Donc, euh, on continue à faire Donc, on est dans l'ILC. Euh, vraiment, l'objectif, nous, c'est concentrer sur le travail, sur l'opportunité qui, euh, qui a aidé aujourd'hui et pour des années à venir. Nous focus sur l'anglais, l'apprentissage anglais. Et puis, nous faisons formation tout dans la technologie. Donc, nous avons commencé à faire là avec Becca. Et puis, entrepreneurship avec business. Donc, rentrer dans l'anglais, l'offre est en anglais, ou capable de focus sur soit technologie ou bien soit business. Nous avons regardé puis devant avec Zamino et Patrick George, nous qui nous avons là avec nous. Patrick, nous avons travaillé sur pour comment nous sommes capables d'offrir jeunes et possibilités, leur idée, que nous sommes capables de faire financement tout, pour permettre que l'idée ça arrive en réalité. So uh, this is what we're doing. We've been focusing on English, uh, technology, and business. And we're working with uh, folks to see if we could come up with non-conventional um, uh, ways of financing uh, our young people's idea. You know, we, we, we're very uh, focused on crowdfunding. You know, if you need 50,000 <laughs> for your business, maybe one person cannot uh, loan you 50,000, but you know, 100 people could come together. Right. And, and raise that, that money. So that's that's another thing we're looking at. But of course, we can't do everything at once. So we'll. Uh, someone said coding in Haitian Creole. Is that possible? <laughs> that, was, that was the final question. Is it possible mm -hmm. in Creole? So coding is a universal. Is universal. So there's no. It's not tied to any. Um, it's not tied to any language in any that language. Way. Yeah. Yeah. But you so there's no difference. There's no difference in coding if I speak Spanish, if I speak French, if okay. I speak English. The coding is going to be the same. Yeah, yeah. All that's right, the nice yeah. thing, actually. That's the nice thing. That's the one thing that gives us. That's why coding doesn't have any barriers. There's really no cultural barrier. Mm -hmm. Anyone can code once they learn the fundamentals. Yeah. Um, they can understand it no matter what language um, yeah, yeah. they speak. All right. Thank you. Becca, you have a nice rest of, the, of your evening. Thank you so much, guys. Everyone take care. Au revoir. Au revoir. Take care. Bonne nuit. Au revoir. <laughs> Bonne nuit. Merci. Bonne nuit.